Look at this insect that we have here on the ground. This is a Jerusalem cricket, otherwise known as a potato bug. These can be a little mean sometimes, but if I handle it gently, maybe it won't bite me. There we are. This insect right here is in the genus Amopelmatus, and to my knowledge, it's the only species of Amopelmatus that lives in this region. And it is quite possible that this one here is the same species that ranges into British Columbia, Canada. These are well known for being a pest, and for that reason, people often think of them as eating mostly just tubers. But in reality, these are at least an equal part carnivore. They feed on all kinds of arthropods and are even cannibalistic. And since these are fully terrestrial and even mostly fossorial, most of what they eat is hidden in the ground and found while burrowing. And because these do not have wings, they've developed an alternative method of attracting mates that isn't chirping. And that method is essentially twerking on the soil to cause vibrations on the ground, which can then be sensed by nearby potential mates. And though mating takes place at night and emopelmatists are predominantly nocturnal, during the mating season, you can see these walking around during the day. And last thing, these do have a pretty squishy butt. Doesn't seem to mind that much. I'm going to place this one Right back in the rocks here, where it was originally walking around. Tonight we are in central Oregon, in a high semi-desert, dominated by junipers and sagebrush, in search of the rubber boa, whose scientific name is Carina bate, or otherwise affectionately known by reptile enthusiasts as the poop snake. Our first rubber boa of the night is sitting right here. You can see that immediately this one is balling up and I'll talk about that behavior in a little bit. This rubber boa that we have here is kind of a medium-sized one. As adults these regularly get larger than a half meter so this one still has some growing to do. And these wrinkles here that you see on the body are what give it the name rubber boa in addition to its small scales and they do actually feel quite a bit like rubber. So given that that morphology is the namesake of this snake it's probably what the snake is most known for but in addition to this these snakes are very well known for never biting humans. I tried to look through as many sources as I could to find out if anyone has ever been bitten by this species, and I couldn't find any bite reports. So either it is excessively rare to receive a bite from one of these, or it doesn't happen at all. This snake has a couple of other defenses. We saw it form a ball with its body, that's its primary defense, but they'll also release musk from their vent sometimes, which I have heard smells pretty bad. And luckily for this snake, it doesn't have any scarring on its tail, but that's often what you see on these snakes, especially adults. And the reason for that is the manner in which they hunt, as well as their prey, these boas predominantly feed on nestling rodents, and to do that, they descend into rodent burrows, find their prey, and if they have to contend with the parents of the rodents, they use the end of their tail as kind of a punching bag or somewhat of a decoy of the head, and this is what the rodents will spend their time biting while the boa either escapes or devours one of the nestlings. But in addition to this, the species has also been known to go after baby birds and eggs. I'm going to release this one now. Right here on the ground, we have a scorpion, and this is a northern scorpion, Perioctinus boreus. So this particular scorpion that we have here is one of the most northern ranging scorpions in all the world. However, it is certainly the most northern ranging scorpion in the New World. And in addition to this, they live predominantly in high elevation habitats, and these two things mean that it's one of the most cold resistant scorpion species in all of the world. In fact, these scorpions are so cold resistant that I have personally found them in good numbers out at night in weather that was only 5 degrees Celsius and with high winds. And in addition to this, these have a very large range, covering a very large portion of the western United States, going all the way up into Canada in two parts of its range. And in this range, they inhabit a diverse number of habitats, predominantly in sagebrush or just outside of conifer forests, as well as a few other habitats, including grasslands and deserts. And like many other scorpions in the United States, these feed on small arthropods and can even take down prey that's its size or even larger. Okay, maybe not that, but trust me when I say that they subdue large prey. I'm just going to leave this scorpion right back here on the ground. Hopefully it can catch one or two of these really annoying moths for itself. We have a garter snake slithering around here. This is a wandering garter snake. Thamnophis elegans, which is the snake that we have here, is commonly referred to as the western garter snake, and it's just this particular subspecies that's referred to as the wandering garter snake. And this one has a very extensive distribution. It's found throughout many of the western states in the U.S., as well as the southern parts of the western provinces in Canada. And throughout most of their distribution, what they inhabit is this high elevation conifer, grassland, or sagebrush dominated habitat. And the only other garter snake species that lives around this area is Thamnophis sertalis, which is the common garter snake. Now that snake that I just mentioned, is fairly dependent on having water nearby, so they're usually found near streams, ponds, and lakes. And the wandering garter snake is kind of the same way, but they can also be found in areas quite far away from water sources. 
And also, quite like the common garter snake, the vast majority of what these wandering garters feed on are frogs. Another interesting thing about this snake's diet, and I'm once again relating this back to the common garter snake, is that in some areas, these will feed on newts, specifically Tarika terosa, and it's been found that in the common garter snake, individuals that feed on those newts can become highly poisonous, and if wandering garter snakes are also eating newts, it's quite possible that they also can become very poisonous, which could make them one of the few snakes in the world that is both poisonous and venomous. We'll let the snake go back on its way. All right, the search has been a little bit slow, so I'm going to transfer to an area that's a bit of a ravine or a canyon, albeit kind of shallow. And there's a lot of rocks there, obviously on the sides. So maybe that will increase the numbers. I'm not sure, we'll see. Right here in this bush, we have a Western long-winged katydid. The scientific name of this katydid is Capnobotes occidentalis, and it's the second most common longwing species after Capnobotes phylogenosis, which is the sooty longwing katydid. These katydids can be found throughout much of the western United States, most notably in states like California, Nevada, Oregon, Arizona, Utah, and so forth. This is a mostly predatory species. It feeds almost exclusively on arthropods, and this is the reason that they have these spines here, which are most prominent on the first and second pair of legs. And while on the topic of anatomy, you can see that this one is a female, and this appendage right here is its ovipositor, which it uses to lay eggs in the ground. Right now is actually the mating season for these, and they will be laying those eggs pretty soon here. But for the time being, you can hear a lot of the males still calling, and they usually call from high up in juniper trees. And I'll play that call for you right now. The species is capable of flight, but if a predator grabs them, they're also able to bite as a defense. But usually when these katydids want to get away, they do this thing where they take very short distance flights across the ground, like you can see this one doing here. This is the bush that I was living in. I'll just leave it right in here. Right over here, we have our second poop snake of the night. And this one, you can actually tell, has that scarring that I was talking about earlier on the tip of the tail here. So we mostly talked about morphology with the last rubber boa, and so a bit on their ecology. These have a fairly large distribution, which you might be able to tell is one of the things that the animals in this video happen to have in common, but they predominantly inhabit Nevada, California, Oregon, Washington, and neighboring states, as well as British Columbia, thus making them the northernmost ranging boa in the world. And throughout the vast majority of this range, their habitat seems to be fairly homogenous. They'll live in grasslands, juniper forests, and other conifer forests. But in California, there's several other habitats that they can be found in. And it's interesting, there's only two species in this genus, Carina, and the other one is Carina umbricata. And that one has an extremely small range compared to Carina bate, which is the one that we have here. And those two species look almost identical. And like I had mentioned with that scorpion, because of their northern range and their tendency to live in high elevation habitats, these are one of the most cold resistant snakes in the world. And there's been many reports of people finding these out on roads at night and near freezing temperatures, which means that in some areas of their range, you can find them pretty much year round. And speaking of activity, these are thought to be mostly crepuscular, which means that they're active at dawn and dusk, but given the right conditions, you can find these at practically all hours of the day. I found this snake approximately right here. And so that is where I will leave it. Right down here on the ground, we have a small camel spider. This particular specimen is from the genus Aromabates, which is in the family Aromabatidae. And the diversity of camel spiders in central Oregon is not very high at all, but there are species from the family Amatrechidae out here as well. Normally the gestation period for this species should have passed. Most of the gravid ones have probably given birth, but there is still a chance that this one will lay eggs sometime soon. But since this one is outside, it is likely waiting for prey. These are both active and passive hunters, which means that they'll both wait and search for prey. And that prey is just small little arthropods. And we can tell that this is a female due to its proportionally large butt, but also the reduced setae on the face. Tonight the temperature is quite warm, but what's interesting about these guys is that you can find them out at night in near freezing temperatures in this particular habitat. I am placing our camel spider right back on the ground here. Right back here, next to this rock, we have a Great Basin gopher snake. you can hear right now, this snake is hissing at me. This is a very common defense for the species. I'm very glad to have found this snake right here, which is Pituophis catenifer deserticola, and that is because it shares some behavior with the rubber boa. 
and that behavior is infiltrating burrows. These gopher snakes aren't necessarily looking for nestling rodents. They're a little bit more indiscriminate, but nonetheless, they are well known for going down into rodent burrows in search of the rodents that inhabit them. And though it may seem already obvious to some, I will clarify that these do not only eat gophers, they eat all kinds of rodents. And this subspecies of Pituophis catenifer is found mostly in California, Nevada, Utah, Idaho, Oregon, and part of British Columbia. But there's a couple other states that it ranges into a little bit too. An interesting thing that I've noticed with these gopher snakes, you can handle them for several minutes and they will mellow out completely. But as soon as you place them back on the floor, they might suddenly become defensive again. And so you can see that this one took the opportunity to strike at me a couple times when I put it back down and put my hand in front of its face. Letting our snake go back next to its rock face here. Well, that will be all for this video of looking for rubber boas in Central Oregon. So, thank you for watching.